Are we good to start? Good afternoon and welcome to the Subcommittee on Planning Dispositions and Concessions. I am Councilmember Ben Kalos. You can tweet me at Ben Kalos. I'm the chair of this subcommittee. We're joined by Councilmember Inez Barron and uh, Councilmember King as well as Councilmember Chaim Deutsch. Today we'll be holding uh, hearings on three projects. Before we begin our hearings, we will be voting to approve two projects we heard on January 30th, land use items 326, 327, and 328, 461 Alabama Avenue and, 40, uh, and land use item 329, East Village Housing, ANCP. Approvals of land use 326, 327, 328, 461 Alabama Avenue will facilitate the development of a proposed seven-story mixed-use affordable and supportive housing development containing 70 apartments and community facility space 60% of those units will be supportive uh, housing for formerly homeless and 40% for units will be affordable housing units at or below 60% of AMI uh, which is uh, one of the lower bands that is actually one of the affordable housing bands uh, and uh, council member Inez Barron is a vocal uh, advocate for affordability and for affordable for whom and uh, with the importance of member deference it is good to see uh, council member Barron leading on this HPD seeks approval of a special permit to allow community facility bulk regulations to be applied to a nonprofit institution with sleeping accommodations HPD also seeks approval for an urban development action area designation project approval disposition approval block 3803 lot 6 and an amendment to the East New York one urban renewal plan. Councilmember Barron has supported this project, and I'd like to invite her to provide some remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be very brief. I just want to say that um, I always try to make sure that the projects that come into the district are finally reflecting what it is that I always talk about, which is providing adequate housing for homeless and to make sure that the housing that's coming in is affordable to the community that lives there so that they are not displaced. And as you have indicated, these are supportive units for people with formerly, for formerly homeless people, as well as those with mental issues. And it is housing for people who presently live there who have a neighborhood median income of only about $40,000 or less. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and uh, for those uh, who are interested, 60% of AMI is a band of a single individual making $43,860 to a family of six making $72,600. So uh, this is uh, affordable for many of New Yorkers where our average income across the city is about $55,000 a year. Uh, Approval of land use item 329, East Village Housing ANCP will facilitate two fully accessible buildings containing approximately 21 units of affordable housing and commercial space. Out of the 21 units, 10 will become affordable cooperative units and 11 will be affordable rental units. HPD seeks approval for an urban development action area designation project approval and disposition approval for block 406, lots 6 and 47 located at 204 Avenue A and 535 East 12th Street. The buildings have been vacant due to structural issues since 2008. Council Member Rivera sub supportive of this project, especially because thanks to this approval, 10 of the original tenants will be relocated a decade ago, will be able to return to their homes. I'd like to now ask the uh, committee council to call the roll on items 326, 327, 328, 329 to approve. Chair Kalos. Aye on all. Um, uh, council Member Deutsch. Aye on all. Council Member King. Aye on all. The land use items are approved by a vote of three in the affirmative, no negative, no abstentions, and will be referred to a full land use committee. Thank you to the committee members for their votes. Thank you again to Councilmember Barron for her leadership, and I hope that we can work together to uh, see similar levels of affordability. Uh, I think one of the things you will notice, and I think you have noticed in this committee, is we tend to ask folks, are the levels of affordability at or near what the community is, or are they set higher than the community? Because I am often concerned that the affordable housing we are building is actually gentrifying the communities where it is being uh, built. So. No, thank you. Uh, we will now move on to uh, public hearings. Our first hearing uh, today will be, give me one moment. Okay. 
First hearing today will be on land use item 330, 67-69 St. Nicholas Avenue in Councilmember Perkins District in Manhattan. HPD is seeking an Article 11 pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law, approval of a new real property tax exemption, termination of a prior exemption for the site. The building as a 27-unit low-income co-op was carved out of the recent Article recent Round 10 of the 33rd Party Transfer Program. Uh, this 40-year uh, tax exemption will be retroactive for 10 years and forward for 30 years. The current HDFC will retain ownership for this building. Uh, I now open the public hearing on land use item 330 67-69 St. Nicholas Avenue. would like to invite HPD to present uh, testimony. Uh, if you could please state your names uh, and uh, the committee council would administer the oath. Genevieve Michael. Nina Psanchak. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? I do. I do. Uh, before you testify, I just want to proactively uh, say thank you to HPD. Uh, last year, during third party transfer, there were a number of properties that were coming before this committee, not for the approval for the transfer, which had been granted by a different committee but for approval for the uh, tax benefits. At the time, I raised concern about moving properties from home ownership to rental and had suggested being able to use processes like this uh, to provide some of the same benefits that would be afforded to real estate developers to the existing owners of properties and to see a HDFC, a tenant to own uh, building, uh, that was pulled from the third party transfer program and uh, where they are seeing their tax arrears uh, forgiven and, and being offered very similar terms to what developers would is, is really a step in the right direction. I appreciate HPD for uh, hearing me on that and so many of my colleagues in the city council on that issue. And so uh, I. It's in, when, when, when one is as critical as I can be from time to time, it is important to acknowledge and say thank you. Uh, that being said, please uh, begin your testimony. Uh, land use number 330 consists of an exemption area containing one privately owned building located at 6769 St. Nicholas Avenue, Block 1823, Lot 56 in Manhattan Council District 9. 6769 St. Nicholas Avenue was taken into city ownership on May 1st, 1993 and subsequently entered entered into the tenter, tenant interim lease program. On June 19, 1997, HPD conveyed the property to the existing tenants as a low income cooperative with household AMIs capped at 121, 120% uh, in accordance with the TIL program guidelines. The building contains two occupied commercial units and 26 residential units, of which four are vacant and the remaining 22 are occupied. The unit mix comprises 23 bedrooms and six four bedroom apartments. The AMIs for the existing shareholders ranges from up to 30% of AMI to above 165% of AMI, and maintenance charges are $515 for the studio, $782 for a three-bedroom unit, and $924 for a four-bedroom unit. Under the new regulatory agreement, new buyers will be subject to 100 and 20% AMI income requirements. The rental units will go for uh, $1,870 for a three bedroom and $2,210 for a four bedroom. The building was a third party transfer program candidate in round 10. However, given the shareholders were working with HPD and the HDFC coalition to come up with a strategy to address their municipal arrears and develop a capital improvement plan to save their building, the council passed local legislation disapproving transfer to new ownership. Components of the plan included the election of a new board of directors by the HDFC in 2018 and the renewal of a 2012 defaulted payment agreement with the Department of Finance for tax arrears dating to 2008. The HDFC also entered into a payment agreement with the Department of Environmental Protection in order to address water and sewer charges. Additionally, the HDFC sold two units in order to bring in revenue and have made progress addressing non-payment by tenants and other shareholders. 
Rehabilitation of the property includes the regular maintenance of the elevator, as well as its replacement within the next three to five years, the installation of a new roof in the spring, and the purchase of a new boiler in 2020. Currently, the cost of these upgrades totals approximately $80,000. In an effort to maintain continued affordability and stability in the building, HPD is before the planning subcommittee seeking retroactive tax benefits that will replace the current partial Article 11 tax exemption. The new Article 11 tax exemption will be retroactive to 2008 and be in place for a total of 40 years. The current estimated cost of the tax benefit is $5,029,380 with a net present value of $2,324,035. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, net present value is high because you are counting the uh, arrears as a full payment up front? Correct. Uh, how much were the arrears? Uh, the retroactive arrears were six, uh, $692,213. Good. Uh, what are the in terms of the uh, upcoming repairs uh, is there anything else beyond the uh, upgrades of 80,000 are there additional uh, violations that need to be uh, cured or anything else beyond that $80,000 that is necessary um, they, I think they currently have uh, 59 violations that need to be cured still. And that $80,000 will cover those 59 violations? The 80000 is what they've spent to date, so there will presumably be more that they're going to spend. Okay, so you are suggesting a, a new boiler, sorry, a new roof in the spring and purchase of a new boiler, uh, and if you may bring the mic closer to you, what would the cost of those be? Um, this is from the Buildings Board. Uh, they have a new roof scheduled for May of this year at a cost of approximately $20,000. Um, and they're planning to purchase a new boiler in 2020. They did not uh, provide an estimated cost for that. In other preservation projects that I have seen, HPD has made funding available for those types of repairs. Was funding being made available from HPD for these repairs? Uh, we, you know, looked at that with the HDFC and looked at, um, I think, our green preservation loan program, which would provide a uh, subsidy to do those repairs. Ultimately, the HDFC decided they were not interested in that, and so that's why we are just here before you with this action today. I appreciate it, so, but the good news is that the 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 resources there, anyone watching at home, uh, if they have an HDFC, they, this green preservation program is available to do roof boiler type uh, repairs and uh, different boards are free to make different decisions. Uh, in terms of um, the uh, AMI, are you familiar with uh, the, the levels of uh, income in the surrounding area. Yes, hold on, I think I have it. I think approximately in the area, based on some rough math, uh, we think it's roughly 60 AMI for a family of three. Thank you. Uh, that is helpful. Uh, and so in your testimony, you indicated that you were, uh, that this program allowed for AMI is up to 120 percent, which is twice the surrounding area, it was something that we discussed with Councilmember Barron previously. Uh, is there an opportunity to have a, a lower threshold in the regulatory agreement for this project? Unfortunately, no. I think our thinking here is we want to make sure that uh, the building is actually able to maintain its fiscal health and financial health, particularly given those um, issues identified. So I think you know we're comfortable going up to 120 AMI just in order to ensure that there is actually a stable cash flow in the building. So 120 AMI would be an individual making $87,720 a year 
to a family of six earning 145200 Correct. And uh, so I guess um, if somebody is seeing this at home and they're interested in either the rental or home ownership opportunities, uh, where should they apply? Uh, all of, the, you know, I think this opportunity as well as many others are available on Housing Connect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there any members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use item 330 and it will be laid over. Second hearing will be on pre-considered land use items uh, East Village Homes Phase 1, East Village Homes Phase 2, East Village Homes NCP, which we will hear together. The applications will facilitate new construction of two mixed-use, mixed-income residential rental buildings with 54 units in total that we built on two non-contiguous vacant city-owned lots. The project will be built in two phases. Phase 1 is located at 302 East 2nd Street, and Phase 2 is located at 276 East 3rd Street. HPD is seeking Article 11 tax exemption pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law for the two sites, an amendment to a previously approved UDAP project. The original UDAP project was approved by the New York City Council on April 29, 2010, under Resolution Number 2014, and July 19, 2006, Resolution Number 450. I now open a public hearing on these applications. I would like to invite HPD to present its testimony. If you can please state your uh, names for the record. Still Genevieve Michael. Erica Benson. Thomas Yu. Kevin Paris. I will now ask the committee council to uh, administer the oath. Before we administer the oath, we will uh, ask the committee council to call the roll on the previous items. Vote on land use items 326, 327, 328, and 329. Council Member Gibson. I vote aye on all. Uh, the final vote stands at four in the affirmative, no negatives, no abstentions, and, we'll, and the items will be referred to the full land use committee. Um, and as for the oath, Ms. Michael, you're still under oath. And for the rest of you, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answers to all council member questions? Yes. I do. I do. You may begin. The pre-considered items are related to a project known as East Village Home, which homes, which consists of two non-contiguous vacant city-owned lots originally approved for disposition in 2006 and 2010 for development as two separate projects. Uh, number 2919-5394 HAM is related to the disposition of 302 East 2nd Street, Block 372, Lot 49, and 276 East 3rd Street, Block Block 372, Lot 11 in Manhattan Council District 2, while number 2019-539-2 HAM and number 2019-539-3 HAM are in reference to Article 11 tax exemption, exemption request for the project, which is slated for redevelopment under HPD's new construction program. In 2019, HPD added the sites to the NIHOP NCP request for qualification, and the development team was selected in 2017 to develop the sites. Under the NPC under the NCP guidelines, city-owned properties are conveyed to sponsors in order to create affordable rental, rental housing on infill sites. Construction and permanent financing is provided through loans from private institutional lenders and from public... May we have a copy of the testimony? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm just trying to get through this. <laughs> <laughs> I like to follow along. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Uh, additionally, funding may also be provided from the syndication of low-income housing tax credits. The newly constructed buildings provide rental housing to low-income, moderate-income, and middle-income families. 276 East 3rd was originally approved by the Council in 2006 to be, to be developed as an eight-bed facility by New York State Office of Mental Health. 302 East 2nd was approved by the Council in 2010 to be developed as part of an assemblage, which would have included a total of 166 units, of which 34 units, or roughly 20%, would be affordable to families with incomes up to 40 and 50% of the area median income. However, due to project financing issues, neither project moved forward, and therefore the sites remain city-owned. 
given the 302 East 2nd Street and 276 East 3rd Street were previously approved, approved for separate projects, HPD is seeking an amendment to the prior approver, approvals in order to develop the two sites for new construction through NCP. The construction will be completed in two phases, and under the proposed project, the city will sell 302 East 2nd Street to East Village Homes Housing Development Fund Company and 276 East 3rd Street to Lois Ida Homes Housing Development Fund Company uh, for $1 each. The proposed project comprises of 44 units at 302 East 2nd Street and 10 units at 276 East 3rd Street for a total of approximately 53 rental dwelling units plus one unit for a superintendent. Additionally, the project will include uh, 1799 square feet of commercial space at 276 East 3rd Street and approximately 714 square feet of community, community facility space at 302 East 2nd Street, which is ten tentatively programmed as social services for the surrounding community. The total development cost is estimated to be $29 million. Uh, across the buildings, there will be a mixture of unit types, including 23 studios, 17 one-bedrooms, and 13 two-bedroom apartments. 10% of the project's units will be set aside for formerly homeless households. Other units will have rents that are affordable to families earning between 27% and 130% of the area median income, so as to serve a wide range of households in the neighborhood. Both buildings will be accessible with two elevators in 302 uh, East 2nd Avenue and one elevator in 276 East 3rd Avenue. As mentioned, pre-considered items number 2019 539 2 HAM and number 2019 539 3 HAM seek article 11 tax benefits for both phases that will coincide with the regulatory agreement for a term of 40 years. The cumulative value of the tax benefits total approximately $9,807,402 with a net present value of $2,603,325 for 302 East 2nd Street. The cumulative value of the tax benefits total approximately $2,629,197 with a net present value of $710,163 for 276 East 3rd Street. In order to facilitate uh, continued affordability of the East Village Homes Project, HPD is before the subcommittee seeking approval of these three pre-considered items, number 2019-539-4HAM, number 2019-539-2HAM, and number 2019-539-3HAM. Um, additionally, it, I think, didn't make it into my testimony, but we are very appreciative to have Rezo A funding uh, in this project from both, both the borough president and the council. Do you know the amounts? I do. Let me pull it. Okay, pull please it continue with the yeah. visual presentation while that is being pulled. Um, the amounts are, uh, it's 500000 from uh, Councilwoman Carlina Rivera and then uh, 300000 from Gail Brewer. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go briefly through the PowerPoint presentation. Um, uh, my name is Thomas Hsu. I'm the co-executive director of Asian Americans for Equality. Uh, we're a 45-year-old nonprofit civil rights organization that in the last 20 years, we also do a lot of uh, affordable housing and small business and homeownership development, uh, along with our social service programs throughout uh, the city and serve over 1.3 million uh, residents of Asian descent and all those in need in New York City. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity for us to present our project, and thank you for your continued advocacy on affordable housing issues. Um, here's a brief slide. Just our history. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into it. Our architect is Leroy Street Studios. Uh, they're also the founders of Hester Street uh, Collaborative, who also is a nonprofit working on a lot of uh, civic engagement via public design. Uh, this is a... a overhead view of the lot. Uh, the two pink uh, lots are the non-contiguous lots uh, on this block uh, in the East Village that we're proposing to develop. Uh, this is the current uh, conditions. Uh, this is the one facing East Houston, uh, dubbed uh, East 2nd Street. Uh, this one is the larger of the two. And then uh, I'm not going to go over the, the unit counts. You have that in front of you. Uh, this is roughly uh, the uh, ground floor and typical floor layouts here. Uh, the third street one is a, a very difficult lot. It's, it's very narrow in between two existing buildings, uh, quite a regular lot. Uh, the most we could fit there were studios, uh, and so that would be the second phase of the project. And this is the one with the commercial space. Uh, then this is... a along with what AFI does, we do a lot of small business technical assistance for small uh, business owners. And so we're looking to work with a lot of the neighborhood retail to put uh, a mom and pop 
uh, retail store uh, that uh, we will have a survey and work with the local community board and other stakeholders to see what's the best type of retail to fit in that space. And then here are the next steps. Uh, we are uh, seeking approval this quarter from city council and then uh, looking to close uh, on construction financing and beginning uh, in June, July of this year. So I appreciate the transparency and the honesty relating to uh, delays. This project appears to have been delayed for at least 13 years for one of the sites. Uh, how can we avoid this moving forward and how many similar projects are still in the pipeline that have been stalled for 10 years or more? I mean, I think that the entire idea of the NCP program maybe not the entire idea, but part of the idea of the NCV program is trying to actually have a term sheet and a program at HPD that does allow sites of this size to move forward. You know, I think as I mentioned, the, uh, you know, one of the sites, the East 2nd Street site was only going to work as part of an assemblage um, where for an 80-20 building. And so I think, you know, from our perspective, this is actually very positive. I think this is a, you know, better term sheet and a better project for the site. Um, you know, I don't know exactly how many are in the pipeline, but I think as you can see based on how we've, how many of these projects have come before the committee, HPD is very focused on bringing these projects that might have stalled out to fruition via this program. When was NIHOP and the NCP created? 2017? 2015? 2015. Okay. So this is just a matter of it was created as part of this new administration one or two years in. And this went into an RFP almost immediately. And so it just took, is there a way to speed up how long that RFP process takes so that it, it's not a four or five year turnaround? I mean, I think, you know, the reality is we have a lot of projects in this pipeline that we are trying to move as fast as possible. But at the end of the day, we can only move so many projects at once. Um, so I think you have seen a lot of them. You will continue to see a lot of them. Um, I certainly understand that it can be a frustrating sign that there are so many projects that have stalled. I consider it actually a good thing and a sign that we are moving forward. In terms of the uh, space uh, that is commercial, is there any commitment in the regulatory agreement or from the developer that it will have an affordable rate. Uh, I think you seem already inclined and so generally I tend to ask folks who come here who are very different developers than yourselves whether or not they will make this space available for uh, community uses and mom and pop shops. Uh, that's our full intention and that's part of uh, the organizational mission. So uh, all our rents uh, in every one of the 40 or so buildings in this area that we run as affordable housing with uh, ground floor retail, they are all below market rate rents. That that makes me uh, happy to hear. i uh, going to run through a whole bunch of uh, quick questions. Uh, who is uh, the uh, You've indicated the uh, design studio. Who is the developer? Uh, who's going to be doing the construction? Um, we're using AAD. Uh, construction as our general contractor. Do you, do you happen to know whether or not your general contractor uh, or any of the other s subs or in terms of Leroy Studio, whether or not uh, they are MWBEs? Uh, AED themselves are not an MWBE. Uh, but we have been uh, working with them so that we will meet the MWB3, uh, MWBE threshold via the subs. And then we also operate a local hiring network so that we want to get a lot of community folks uh, lined up for job opportunities. You're, you're skipping ahead in my uh, piece, <laughs> but so uh, what is the local hiring uh, requirement or what are you willing to commit to over and above the local hiring requirement? Um, I forget the exact uh, uh, number we pledged to on this project. Do you have that off there? I don't, but we can certainly get it to you. Yeah, but we would always seek to uh, exceed, and um, we can call uh, our office, uh, Asian Americans for Equality, for uh, access to the network. We uh, generally uh, have a job placement and training so that folks who come in 
uh, not only for this project, for a number of other uh, different types of employment opportunities throughout uh, New York City come in. Uh, we work with folks, uh, maybe they're not skilled yet, uh, identify ways that they can uh, uh, level uh, their uh, vocational training and then uh, f work with all our co general contractors to hire folks. Yeah. If somebody is watching at home right now and they would like a job at this site, building it or working on it and maintaining it, or even uh, as part of this network, what number should they call? Uh, our general office line is 212-964-2288, and they can ask for the AFI Job Placement Network. I'm going to stick on that line. Uh, one of the best ways we can deal with the affordable housing crisis is to pay people sufficiently so that they don't necessarily need the lowest levels of affordable housing. Uh, and this is just to the developer. Uh, so far, I'm liking everything you're he mm -hmm. I'm hearing. Uh, are you able to ensure that the contractor that you're working with and that in running the buildings that people will be paid the right the, the wages commensurate with the type of work that they are doing that they will have health insurance so they can go to a doctor if they get hurt uh, either constructing or maintaining that they'll be able to one day retire because they have access to a retirement plan they get disabled that they'll have more than workers comp but disability insurance are, are those uh, will those be available? Uh, yeah, we'll work with uh, our uh, general contractors to make sure that their workers are uh, paid fairly, and they're one of the more uh, active uh, general contractors in the city with a lot of city contracts. Uh, so they uh, work above board, and which is why we're careful in selection of our general contractor. And even in our uh, building operations, when the buildings are in place, uh, we run in-house our own uh, property management office, and uh, all workers uh, full-time have uh, all the benefits that you, you listed. Wow. Okay. Thank you. This is uh, going better than, than normal. Uh, th will the buildings be accessible? Uh, yeah, as I mentioned in my testimony, um, one will have two elevators, one will have one elevator. This is, could, can we just bid the projects out to, can you just make sure to bid on all the projects, please? Because <laughs> this, this does not usually go this well. Uh, in terms of the, uh, there's a $29 million total project cost. Uh, what are the hard costs associated with this project, and what are your soft costs? Um, so altogether, uh, if we combine the buildings, about 21, uh, I'm sorry, 20 million are for hard costs, uh, 6.3 million roughly is for the soft costs. Okay, in this HPD testimony, they had $29 million for the total development cost, so I'm still missing $3 million. Mm. I see your version. There were, there's, uh, there might be uh, some late changes because we're still negotiating with the general contractor to see if they get lower there. You might have just gotten yeah. an additional $3 million. <laughs> uh, in terms of the developer fee, what is your developer fee? Um, that's still uh, in flux, but we're hoping to get uh, uh, $2 million, half of which uh, we will not get at closing. It's through uh, maintaining the project well for 15 years, and we'll derive that from only from net uh, cash flow. I appreciate the set aside for formerly homeless. Uh, we've been pushing for a goal of 15% set aside. Would you be open to a 15% set aside for formerly homeless? I, I need you to say a word into the record. Yes. Please. Uh, would HPD be open to additional financing to reach our 15% set aside goal? Uh, I think in order to make the financing work on this project, we would probably then have to raise the AMIs of some of the units. So that goes to the uh, next piece, back to the uh, developer. Um, 
currently you're setting AMIs at 27% of AMI to 130%, and because I like to try to say things in real numbers, uh, that's about for $21,930 is 30% of AMI for a single individual, and 130% of AMI is $157,300 for a family of six. So that is a large range. Uh, do you, are you familiar with, and this is for the developer or HPD, the uh, AMI for those living in the surrounding area? Uh, yeah, so we looked at the Furman Center uh, State of the New York City Neighborhoods report, and roughly uh, you have the, the uh, what we call Community Board 3 of, of Manhattan uh, split into five quintiles, and if we were to take that, uh, it's it's almost like uh, more or less even uh, along the lowest four quintiles and the smallest in the folks that make 250,000 or more. And so our AMI mix does reflect uh, as closely as possible uh, each segment. And so we were very cognizant of trying to create uh, uh, apartments for each housing band in the what we saw in the census tracts. What is your breakdown? Um, we have here a mix. Um, do I have the number here? Uh, combined, uh, we have 11% homeless units, 8% for 30% AMI, 13% for 50% AMI, 23% for 80% AMI, 12% uh, for 100% AMI, 17% uh, for 130, and then there's a higher bracket, also 17% for uh, 165, but underwritten at 130. Thank you. Uh, do you, so, so you're, what is your role in Asian Americans for Equity? Uh, I'm the co-executive director. Uh, so how much of your portfolio is, relates to advocacy and uh, a lot of the other parts of your mission versus development? Um, I don't have the exact number. Development does play uh, one of the larger roles, uh, but I would say maybe a third of our activities are about uh, development. We have uh, a lot of micro lending for entrepreneurs, uh, a home repair lending technical assistance program, getting folks educated about financial literacy. We do uh, senior care, youth services, job placement, and your regular immigration, social services, and entitlement help. So um, you've now gotten a lot of the questions I've been asking in the committee uh, relating to the amount of financing, the amount of subsidy, uh, MWBE status, accessibility status, commercial affordability for commercial space, comparing the area median income to what you're building. Do you think those are, are the right questions to be asking of developers before the committee? Yeah, and I hope you continue <laughs> to, to grill every developer. <laughs> As an affordable housing advocate, we do a lot of the, uh, that type of advocacy, too. Is there anything I'm missing that I, I should be adding? Um, I would say, uh, not, they're going to kill me for this, <laughs> but uh, sometimes language access. Uh, we work with a lot of immigrant populations, and sometimes even amongst when buildings are in operations, uh, uh, is it a responsible property manager dealing with the tenants? So, I uh, <laughs> I will accept that. So tell me about uh, the languages spoken in your census area or, or neighborhood, and what type of language access is available. Um, in this neighborhood, uh, it's primarily uh, English, Spanish, and Chinese. Uh, so within our uh, staffing and property management uh, personnel, they cover all of those languages. But throughout the city, uh, we have a lot of developments in Queens and Brooklyn as well that can uh, tally up to dozens of languages. So. What languages will marketing materials be available in? Uh, all three languages. Great. Uh, anything else I should have asked with regards to language access? I think that's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I, I will tell you that this this grilling <laughs> is the uh, the this was this has been the most positive experience for me as a, a chair. I guess uh, I'm, I'm not sure how it went for you, but uh, usually these 
go a, a lot differently. Uh, so I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. And uh, if you have specific language in terms of questions you'd like to see other developers get asked, I, I will actually accept your recommendation and start asking people about the accessibility. And uh, in terms of the current Housing Connect site, which we are working, I am proud to be working closely with HPD, and HPD is very uh, open and transparent and, and working well on this. Uh, how could we improve Housing Connect to make it more accessible and easier for you to work with in terms of for marketing your materials? Is it available in enough languages right now? And also from the administrative side of, of using it to do the offering. Do you have any quick feedback? Yeah, um, uh, we would welcome uh, any uh, robust uh, translations for the uh, online portal. One of the things that uh, we helped the marketing process for another HPD funded development in Flushing uh, for 232 units, and we received a, a staggering 85,000 applications for that. And uh, it, it basically all the, the applicants ran, uh, we received, uh, came from uh, every language and background you can think of that, uh, in terms of residents of New York City. And one of the things we found that uh, in especially the lower income spectrums, uh, they have difficulty getting uh, computer or internet access to access uh, Housing Connect. So to the extent uh, HPD or the city council can look towards in the future, uh, funding a lot of different, uh, uh, particularly nonprofit or resident groups to help uh, with that, providing that technical assistance, maybe as someone that uh, the, the community residents trust to work with them to help them uh, fill out something online would be very helpful and expand accessibility for all applicants. Well, I was only, I mean, one, I think HPD is absolutely happy to always look at ways to improve upon our housing ambassador program, but I also thought I would be remiss if I didn't point out that that number of uh, applications received for that number of units speaks to why it is so important that we continue to produce as many units as we are, particularly all the ones that are coming through this committee. Uh, so I, I'm learning something new. So there's a housing ambassador program, and I guess is that available for this per specific development, or how can we, uh, what money is available as part of the marketing for this project to ensure that we're reaching out to folks on the other side of the digital divide? So, so what I meant by our housing ambassador program is we work with community groups w throughout the city to help us with the marketing process. Mm -hmm. um, I th think you guys might even mm -hmm. be a housing ambassador. Um, so I think that would cover it on this project, but I certainly you know, think there is room for us to have further conversations about that program. So I guess to Asian Americans for Equality, would you be able to do the same type of community outreach that you've done? Uh, is that something that should be reflected as part of the budget? Is that a question I should be asking in terms of marketing to do grassroots and technical assistance with completion of 85,000 applications? <laughs> uh, it, it certainly helps. Uh, we do have a marketing budget for this uh, project. Generally, uh, we would exceed the budget because we want to cover more people and sometimes it's just not eligible costs uh, or within the budget. So uh, we would use kind of uh, limited uh, unrestricted funds from our nonprofit budget mm -hmm. to cover that uh, since that's mission oriented but to the extent we can always increase the support for groups all over the city to do this would be great okay um, does anyone else have any questions do we have any testimony from the public uh, seeing none uh, I, I will now close the public hearing on uh, this application and they will be uh, laid over and, and give me your card uh, because I, I look forward to uh, having more of this conversation. Sure. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you.
Our third hearing will be on pre-considered land use 32-34 Putnam Avenue cluster, this, which consists of a group of buildings in uh, Majority Leader Cumbo's district and Council Member Cornegie's district in Brooklyn. The project includes six partially occupied city-owned buildings that will provide 51 affordable cooperative dwelling units, five affordable rental dwelling units, and four storefront commercial spaces. HPD is seeking, pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law and Section 577 of Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law, approval of an urban development action area project and real property tax exemption. This property is located at 32 Putnam Avenue, 34 Part. Putnam Avenue, 550 DeKalb Avenue, 55 Carlton Avenue, 374-76 Prospect Place, and 1216 Pacific Street. Uh, and I will now turn to my uh, to the majority leader to see if she has any comments she wishes to make before we begin. Thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Kalis. I don't have any questions at this time. Um, I'd rather hear the testimony and then pose questions um, that my constituents have proposed for me. Thank you. Uh, if you could please state your names for the record. Lacey Tauber, HPD. Christine Retzoff O'Connell, HPD. Hi, Emilio Dorsley, President and CEO of Bridge Street Development Corporation. Thank you. I'll ask committee council to administer the oath. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all of council members' questions? Yes. I do. Yes. Thank you. Okay. This pre-considered item consists of the proposed disposition of six city-owned multiple dwellings and the approval of Article 11 tax benefits for the buildings located at 3234 Putnam Avenue, 55 Carlton Avenue, 550 DeKalb Avenue, 374 Prospect Place, and 1216 Pacific Street, located in Brooklyn Council Districts 35 and 36. Known as the 3234 Putnam Avenue ANCP cluster, the six buildings entered city ownership through in rem, for, in rem foreclosure actions between 1979 through 1983 for non-payment of real property taxes, and all except for 1216 Pacific Street opted into the tenor, Tenant Interim Lease, or TIL, program between 2000 and 2002. As a requirement of the TIL program, tenants from form tenant associations to manage their building and collect rents under a net lease from the City of New York. Currently, the tenants in the partially occupied TIL buildings have met the threshold requirements and are ready to move forward with the next steps in cooperative conversion under HPD's Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program, or ANCP. As part of the ANCP program guidelines, city-owned multiple dwellings are conveyed to restoring communities HGFC for $1 per tax lot and then rehabilitated by private developers selected through a competitive process to create affordable cooperatives for low and moderate income households. The developer Bridge Street Development Corp, or BSDC, will sign a site development and management agreement with restoring communities that will be in effect until co-op conversion occurs and title transfers from restoring communities HGFC to a tenant-formed HGFC cooperative. From the time of the cooperative conversion, the developer will remain the property manager for at least one year. After the first year, the co-op will have the choice of keeping the developer as property manager or hire a new company approved by HPD. The 3234 Putnam Cluster has a total of 56 residential units, of which 32 are occupied and 24 are vacant. The cluster also contains four vacant commercial spaces, two at 550 DeKalb Avenue and two at 55 Carlton. The household incomes for the existing tenants range from 11% to 119% AMI, and the co-op interests attributable to occupied apartments will be sold to the existing tenants for $2,500. Additionally, the maintenance is anticipated to be approximately 42% of AMI for existing tenants, which is roughly $846 for a one-bedroom unit, $1,026 for a two-bedroom unit, and $1,179 for a three-bedroom unit. The cooperative interest attributable to vacant apartments will be sold for a price affordable to families earning no more than 110% of the area median income. 1216 Pacific Street, which is a vacant building that has been sealed since 2001, is in HPD's Division of Property Management and Client Services, PMCS. This division manages and maintains city-owned properties until they can be transferred to responsible private ownership. 1216 Pacific Street will become a rent-stabilized property with five units under the ownership of the developer. 
Initial rents will be set at 100% of AMI, roughly $1,899 for a one-bedroom unit. Each building will undergo substantial rehabilitation, which will include layout changes in order to conform to DOB building codes and handicap accessibility. The scope of work includes replacement of structural joists, work to the envelope of the building, as well as work to the electrical, plumbing, and heating systems. Interior work will also include new bathrooms and kitchen fixtures, entry doors, new flooring, and upgrades to the public hallways. During the construction, the existing tenants will be temporarily relocated to units provided by the sponsor in nearby neighborhoods. Post re rehabilitation, the mixture of unit types will be 21 one-bedroom, 33 two-bedroom, and two three-bedroom apartments. 51 will be cooperative units, while the five units at 1216 Pacific Street will be rental units. The total development cost is estimated to be $24,566,731, which is subject to change. In addition to seeking disposition approval, HPD also requests a 40-year Article 11 tax exemption in order to help the HGFCs maintain affordability. The term of the tax exemption will be coterminous with the regulatory agreement, and the total tax benefit is approximately $10,721,516, with a net present value of $2,995,283. We provided a one-pager with some background on, on Bridge Street. Um, you're welcome to give some background, if you like, on the organization, but we don't have a formal presentation. And good afternoon. My name is Emilio Dorsley. I'm the president and CEO of Bridge Street Development Corporation. Uh, Bridge Street Development Corporation, often known as BSCC, uh, was founded in 1995 and was uh, created by the members of the oldest continuing African-American congregation in Brooklyn, uh, which is Bridge Street Wesleyan um, African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, we basically have a mission of trying to create partnerships to help benefit and create a higher quality of life in neighborhoods in central Brooklyn with a focus on low to moderate income individuals. In addition to the affordable housing work we do, we have a number of program areas. We do work in home ownership services, uh, which is primarily focused on preventing foreclosure and helping first time home buyers uh, become buyer ready. We have our community engagement programs, which is focused on a number of different areas, youth development, which currently we have a program that provides both in-school and out-of-school youth with civic engagement and with job training through the NDA program. We also have the work that we do with, ec with um, economic development, which focuses primarily on small, local mom and pop businesses, primarily storefront businesses. Um, last year, we had over 10 businesses graduate from our small business boot camp, which was an opportunity to help increase the capacity of small, local <coughs> storefront businesses to make sure that they can continue to um, both survive and hopefully uh, become better as the neighborhoods continue to change. We also do work with helping to make sure that we can get people in the neighborhood to know and to shop locally. So we've had a number of different special events with over 5,000 people attending um, to help promote some of the local businesses, whether it be on Tompkins Avenue, um, Bedford Avenue, Malcolm X Boulevard. Um, we also have the work that we do under community engagement, which is around tenant advocacy and community organizing. That focuses on primarily two areas. One, helping to promote and develop and support tenant and block associations. We provide them with technical assistance. We help them start. We help them keep um, going. And we make sure that they can speak to the issues in their neighborhood. And we actually helped to create a couple of years ago the Bed-Stuy Works Alliance, which is an alliance of block and tenant associations that gets together on a regular basis to be able to discuss and identify issues of concern to the neighborhood. Um, we also have the work that we do with seniors, which is based out of 625 Quincy Street, which is a new construction building that we developed um, almost 10 years ago. Uh, and we provide a whole range of services to seniors, ranging from being able to assist them um, with aging in place, primarily providing them with um, case management, educational and social recreational activities, everything from helping them get on Facebook through our computer center uh, to making sure that they have activities such as line dancing and chair yoga. The idea is that we want to make sure our elders have an opportunity to age in place in a neighborhood that they've always called as, as home. So, so that's some of the programming work that we do. 
But we also have a pretty robust affordable housing development pipeline. Um, we've done both new construction and substantial rehabilitation. And this project is something that is dear, dear to our heart because Bridge Street Development Corporation started in 1995 as a way of being able to make sure some of the abandoned brownstones in Bedford-Stuyvesant found new owners and were able to make sure that we've revitalized the neighborhood. And this is just yet another opportunity to make sure that we can increase affordable home ownership in neighborhoods that really need it. To the majority leader for any statement and questions. Thank you so much. And I just have a few questions about how this process will happen. I'm very well aware of the work of Bridge Street and have been following and participating in your work for over 20 years now. So happy to have you here and part of this process. So my first question goes to, um, for the developments that are in my district, how long are we anticipating the renovation time would actually be? Sure. Currently, uh, we're anticipating that the relocation period should be up to about 22 months, but uh, we're targeting somewhere between 18 to 22 to be able to complete the construction period and be able to get people back into their original apartments. Okay. Now, would all of the construction on, let's say, the three sites in my district, would they be happen happening simultaneously or at different periods of time? And I asked that question to determine, do you actually have the ability to house that many tenants relocated at the same time, or are you going to space it out in order to be able to accommodate the number of people that would be relocated at one particular time? Currently, the project only has one actual phase, um, but the relocation process is somewhat staggered. And so as of right now, we are working with uh, two buildings that have completed the relocation um, documentation process, which means they signed all the forms and they are in the process of actually relocating. We have at least two, two units um, from, I believe, um, at least one of the buildings in your district that has already relocated and another two that are scheduled to relocate next weekend. And we hope to have one building fully um, vacant um, before the end of this month and are in the process of working to um, schedule another six people from other buildings. And the hope is that we will have at least three buildings um, actually fully relocated prior to closing so that those buildings can begin construction immediately and then within the first month of construction be able to reloc complete the relocation process for the last building so that all of the buildings would be under construction about the same time. Have you relocated and done a renovation and have tenants move back in? Have you completed a process like that? Yes, as in, um, in fact, we are currently in the process of completing a, a project where it was um, nine buildings located in three neighborhoods. Um, the neighborhoods were Bedford-Stuyvesant, Crown Heights, and Park Slope and about 74 units, where about half of them were occupied, and we had to relocate um, at least two-thirds of the tenants and be able to bring them back to their original units. Lessons learned from that project? Lessons learned is that relocation is difficult, um, and then we try to build in as much cushion time for the reality of the variation of people's individual lives and concerns so that we can do our best uh, to meet their needs, but the reality is that we're not going to be able to meet every single need, but there are certain minimum requirements. One, we try our best to make sure <coughs> that we provide them in an apartment that is in a fairly similar neighborhood and close by. Two, we try to provide them with a unit that is a fairly similar size, and if not, we then try to pay attention to the household size, and then we try to deal with special concerns such as if individuals have mobility issues and whether they have special requirements where they need to be on a lower floor. And we try to take all these variables and work with them and then at the same time try to make sure that people have real lives and real schedules to try to work within the construction schedule but still trying our best to accommodate any type of schedules that may prevent them from moving in the ideal time that we would like and work with them to try to find some type of mutual 
um, time that works, but still without it creating excessive delays for the project. And who pays for the moving costs and handles that? That is all part of the project budget. Okay, so the residents do not have to incur any moving costs. They don't actually have to move their belongings themselves. Yes, what we tell them is that, one, uh, we hire the movers. We work with them to select the date. We ask them if they need um, storage, and if they do, we coordinate with the movers. We've also actually added an additional, because some um, tenants have already told us, or residents have told us, where they have things that they may not want to bring to the relocation unit, and we've worked it out with the moving company that they will dispose of items that they no longer want. Um, and so, and we also provide moving boxes and moving materials. And so we do our best to try to accommodate them, but as you can imagine, people who have lived in a unit for sometimes well over 20 years, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a um, mm -hmm. difficult process, and we do it the best we can to hold their hands, but uh, it's still a very difficult process for some of them. So walk me through the process a, a bit, because there seems to have been some miscommunication or confusion on the part of um, residents in my district in terms of them seeing ads where their buildings are going to be sold for a dollar. So there's the discrepancy or the confusion mm -hmm. that residents have that their buildings are being sold for a dollar um, and giving them the impression that, and I want to read in quote actually, um, a tenant states that the city is selling the building to a developer for $1, which is completely nullifying the TIL agreement. And the TIL program enables tenants to manage and collect rent to deposit into a bank account and do repairs. So can you explain to me the dollar sale um, and how tenants can um, understand that they are not being displaced or moved from their homes? Sure. So I'm Christine Rutzoff. I'm the director of ANCP that's facilitating the development with Bridge Street. Um, the, the tenant body, we've been meeting with them since the project was assigned in late 2016. Um, we've provided a number of written materials um, as well as in-person meetings. And, and the talking point has always been that at construction loan closing, the property is transferred to Restoring Communities HDFC. They are a nonprofit partner, and their sole role is to own the buildings during construction and also to apply for the New York State Affordable Housing uh, Corporation grant, the AHC grant. Um, at no time will the develop developer ever own the building because we want to make sure that the tenants have that secure feeling that the developer is coming in to do a job. The job is to work on behalf of the resident to facilitate the renovation and then to walk away once the conversion to cooperative happens. Um, and so that is what we are, that's what we were asking for today is actually uh, the approval to dispose of the property to Restoring Communities HDFC for the price of a dollar, which is sort of our historical uh, transfer cost. It's, you know, it's, it's really um, sort of uh, symbolic versus a real value that we're exchanging. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, the developer will never own the building. It's, it's intended that way for ANCP. Um, uh, and once the conversion to cooperative happens, the, the, the um, restoring communities will exit. They will no longer own the property. So the tenants have the opportunity to return back home. Yes. To purchase their unit for approximately $2,500. Correct and they would be considered a shareholder now in the building of a home that they formerly rented. That is correct. How long will they be a co-op owner? Does that expire? It does not. Um, usually a proprietary lease, which is the legal document that connects the tenant to, to the ownership in, in the building, usually has a term of 99 years, which again is, is sort of symbolic versus uh, a real end or conclusion to an ownership term. Um, it's intended that in 99 years, the lease would be re renewed, the proprietary lease. And that's the same across um, all HDFC cooperatives. Um, the, the shareholders will remain as owners of their building. 
Um, and we have put a lot of um, thought and uh, policy decisions into ANCP so that we can make sure that these are buildings that will be created under this program and they will exist as co-ops long into the future and they will be protected from uh, concerns about mismanagement, um, uh, lack of operating funds, um, any kind of repair issues down the line. They will, they will be saving all the while making sure that their co-op can last long into the future. So they have a co-op. So three, I guess, rapid fire questions would be, sure. um, can this uh, co-op transition from family member to a family member, um, particularly in death, can it transition in an estate from one family member to another family member? The other question is, can they sell their co-op for market value? And the third would be, can they take out a mortgage or a loan based off of the, the value of the co-op? Um, okay, so for the first question, ownership can be transferred. Uh, you, you, they own the shares, right? So they have the right to transfer those shares uh, to a family member or to a friend. Uh, basically, we recommend to residents that they, they get a will. They're going to have something of great value that they want to ensure that there's a, a process codified so that if they want to do that transfer, they can do so. Um, so yes, there is the right to transfer the shares. Um, to a family member through a will, something like that. Um, if the tenant wants to sell the unit, if the, the shareholder wants, wants to sell the unit, they also retain the right to do so. Um, we do restrict the amount of profit that an owner can, um, can realize from the sale. Uh, basically, the longer that a tenant or a shareholder lives in the unit, uh, the, the more profit they recognize. Um, so it, it's incentivizing long-term home ownership, um, and it's also ensuring that folks aren't buying in at 2,500, or the vacant apartments aren't buying in at, at the lower prices that we're setting for the initial conversion, and then the next day flipping for right. our, for a higher price. So the longer that they live in the unit, the more profit they realize. And and just to confirm or, or to state it, profit is over and above what they paid, and it's over and above closing costs. So we don't want anyone to be out of pocket, right? We want them to be made whole when they sell, um, but the profit will be subject to a flip tax. So the amount uh, of the profit that is not taken home by the seller, it, it's retained by the cooperative for the benefit of the cooperative. Um, and the third question you asked, oh, you had also asked about um, market. These are not market. Um, our initial sales are going to be at 100% of area median income, um, which is, about 50 to 60% less than market now. Um, and then the income restriction will be at 110% of area median income. And the third question that you mentioned, if they can take out a loan. right, if they can take out a loan. Um, so we do expect that the buyers of the vacant apartments will have to obtain a mortgage to purchase their, uh, their apartments at 100% of area median income. Um, and so, but we do expect that with the full gut renovation that will occur as part of this process um, and the reserves that will set up for the co-op, that they won't need to take out individual loans um, for renovations in the building. If an individual shareholder wants to make upgrades to their apartments beyond what we're providing as part of the renovation, they could take out a loan um, against the equity that they've built up uh, in, their, in their apartment but it would be subject to the individual apartment and not the entire cooperative value. So if you wanted to utilize, if you wanted to take out equity based off of the fact that you wanted to purchase a home somewhere else, could you do that? That's a great question. So um, for the purposes of this program, the regulatory agreement states that um, for the outside, the outside purchasers, they actually have to be first-time home buyers, so they cannot have owned property anywhere ever before. Um, for existing families, or say someone wants to take out, wants to get a summer home or something like that. That sounds um, nice. It is nice, <laughs> or a timeshare. Um, oh, wow. It has to be within 100 miles of New York City. So it's further out than Philly, it's further out than, than Montauk. So, the, the other question that I have about that is if you, um, 
it was about the mortgage. I wanted to know about the mortgage, but then I wanted to know if it's going to come back to me. It'll have to come back to me, but it but it's an important point, and I want to definitely um, bring it back to that. So I'm going to put a pin on it right there um, because I asked about the – oh, so this is what happened. So if someone does not want to move mm -hmm. and you're doing this gut rehab, what, what do you do? What happens there? So it does happen. Um, this is not the only project that we're working on right now, so we've we've seen that scenario. Um, in most cases, we have a majority that want to move, right? So you you may have out of uh, ten a group of ten, maybe one person says no, I'm not going anywhere, um, because there is a you know publicly sponsored process, because there's there's money that's been laid out, because there's uh, you know order to show that the renovation is necessary, that the conditions warrant the renovation, um, the resident may be forced through court action to actually vacate the premises if they if they refuse to sign a relocation agreement. And we, we do our best to, HPD does our best in, in partnership with our developer to ensure that the requirements are in writing the entire time that uh, we go through pre-development, that the re relocation is required, um, that we that we really stress it during meetings. We have a separate meeting with tenants to talk about relocation because it is such a big um, responsibility. So we want to make sure that throughout the entire process, folks are thinking about this, that they're ready, that they're thinking about the boxes coming and what they want to keep or what they don't want, what they want to go into storage. And for folks at the end of the day, if we're going through pre-development for two years, two and a half years, and they say, I'm still not moving, we, we may have to um, start a legal action. I remembered my question. Okay. They say I'm not old enough to claim senior moments, so I claim mommy brain. <laughs> but the two worlds are starting to collide faster each day. Um, about uh, ideas around Airbnb. Mm. So co-ops, from what I understand, are often very particular about people or individuals airbnb -ing their spaces out. Mm -hmm. So if someone chose that they wanted to, maybe this isn't their primary um, living space, mm -hmm. if they decided they wanted to Airbnb it, could they? Or not even, let's take it Airbnbs on the extreme. Mm -hmm. Oh, Sublet. yeah, I'm subletting. My cousin's coming in. She's going to stay there. She's going to college. She'll live there. Mm -hmm. Because in many co-ops, they won't even allow your cousin Right. And you're paying the rent to just live there and you don't live there. So that is part of the policy that we've implemented for ANCP. So we do not allow any kind of Airbnb situation. Uh, residents must certify annually that this is their primary residence. They must stay there 270 days out of the year, uh, reference the address on their tax returns, driver's license. It has to be their primary residence. Um, there are some extreme situations where somebody may want to sublet if they're active military, um, and, and we would recognize that. It would have to be approved by HPD first, um, but subletting and Airbnb are actually not allowed, and the, the owner, um, the individual shareholder at that point, could be subject to a fine or worse. And if the co-op is, you know, if it becomes a pervasive problem in the co-op, um, HPD would, would intervene and um, seek legal action. It's, it's, it's a lesson learned. Got it. Thank you. This um, on paper sounds like an incredible opportunity for the residents to have home ownership within their community, and that's such a rarity at this time. Um, we are hopeful, prayerful, um, that this transition is one that is uh, beneficial to the community, that it doesn't disrupt people's everyday lives and um, and as you testified, I'm confident that you're making all provisions to make sure that families are kept in place and parents that have to get to work and drop their kids off at school and drop them off at daycare and pick them up, that 
a change in dynamic like this can be very difficult and challenging. So we are we are hoping that this will be one that you have enough infrastructure and support in order to provide that for our constituents. So thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Thank you. So I have a new set of questions that I hadn't ever asked before relating to uh, the languages in the commu surrounding community. So what are the languages spoken in the surrounding community and uh, what languages are your av materials available in? And, uh, and so what is the lang language accessibility for this project? Uh, the, the majority of the residents in this cluster are English speaking. Um, I believe there are a couple of Spanish-speaking residents, but predominantly English. Every communication that we have put out uh, is always duolingual, whether it's needed or not, so always in English and Spanish. Um, and where we have recognized that residents have language needs other than English and Spanish, we always opt for um, translation. And every meeting that we do with tenants, we also bring interpretation services. And as part of the marketing process that we work with HPD marketing department, um, the marketing materials are um, required to be provided in multiple languages in order to make sure that the widest number of community members can access the ability to uh, complete the marketing materials and also enter the lottery process. And do you provide a technical assistance with completing the applications? We generally do. Um, generally what we do as part of this process, uh, we sometimes have done these processes ourselves. Other times we've hired a third party and generally what happens is that we are required to do advertising in both a local paper, a larger city paper, and then we do multiple community meetings in order to make sure that the surrounding area residents understand the process and it's usually set in a convenient location near public transportation to be able to encourage and inform people what the process is and how they can be engaged and involved. Uh, I want to take a moment to thank HPD again in this hearing. Uh, don't, don't let it go to your heads, but I really do appreciate that uh, this testimony included a lot of specific numbers about what the rental rates would be. I, I find AMI is very hard uh, to access, so that is helpful. Uh, do you happen to know the uh, incomes of the surrounding neighborhood and whether the 100% AMI level is uh, appropriate uh, for the five, uh, for the initial rents at 100% of AMI, which uh, translates to uh, $73,100 for a single individual to $121,000 for a family of six? Yeah, so I have some, some data that's a little out of date. It, it, as referenced earlier, the, the state of New York City neighborhoods from NYU Furman Center, I'm looking at data from 2016, which says that the median household income is about $76,000. Um, I can get you a, a more updated number. So, so therefore, you feel that the number you've said is, is on track? Uh, I feel like it's on track, but it, it's probably I hope that it's gone up since 2016. I, and, and so I will look, if you can send me the link to the Furman Center, I, yeah. I've been using the New York City Planning Population Fact Finder, uh, which shows census data indicating a median household income of 72,772. 72, it is yes. Uh, <laughs> let the record reflect. Somebody in the uh, re let the record reflect, and if if uh, my colleague gets to say "mommy brain," I hope to get to say uh, "daddy brain." Uh, but uh, the mean household income is actually ninety four thousand to twenty four, uh, with uh, interestingly enough about thirty percent of the community in households earning more than a hundred thousand dollars a year. So. Uh, I would just say that we're looking at a bunch of different neighborhoods here, and it, it varies kind of widely across the neighborhoods I was that we're looking at. Looking at so. Putnam for that. Yeah, I mean, fact. we're looking, we have properties in Bed-Stuy and, and Clinton Hill and um, Crown Heights, Prospect Heights, so it varies across those neighborhoods. The New York City Population Fact Finder allows you to select multiple yes, census Yes, I, I did that. 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, we're looking at probably an average of around between 60 and 70 percent AMI for a family of three. But again, it's a broad range across these neighborhoods. I, I want to appreciate HPD for, for hearing uh, my concerns and w whether or not my concerns had anything to do with it. It seems like today both multiple projects have been on track. For Bridge State Development Corporation, what contractor have you selected to do the repairs? Uh, we will be working with Notias Construction. Notias Construction. Okay. And uh, do you know if they are an MWBE? Um, Notias Construction is not an MWBE, but we are in the process of working with them to make sure that um, subcontractors are sufficiently um, enough MWBEs to make sure that we can meet our goals. And also, as part of the project, our project architect is an MWBE, and that will help to um, bring us to the goal that is set for this particular project for MWBE. What are your expected hard costs on this project? I believe the uh, hard costs are at $14,785,275. Uh, what are your soft costs? Uh, the soft costs are about 10% of that at $1,478,528. And I just want to say those numbers are pretty specific. So yeah. just we always like to add that those can change up to project closing. And I think Christine has yeah. a clarification. Just a clarification on the soft costs. We're expecting that the soft costs are $8.3 or about 34% of the total budget. Hard cost is 66%, and HPD is going to finance 57% of the budget. Okay. Uh, thank you. So there seems to be, can somebody help explain the discrepancy between the developers, because it seems like the total, the developers' costs look at like 1.16 million, and yours look like 24 million, so where is the $7 million discrepancy? So. We have a little cheat sheet, and it's it's um, more detailed than, than you, what you usually ask for. So I did a little tally beforehand. Um, our hard costs are 14, as, as Emilio mentioned, and our soft costs are 8.3. OK, what are the, OK. Where does the, where are your set additional $7 million in, in hard costs going? And that still only gets us to 22 million versus 24 million. So our hard costs are 4.7, but um, we also have contingency that we, we don't reference, which is, uh, what did I say? Something? You said four. Oh, our hard okay. costs are 14 In million. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, and our, our contingency for hard costs is 1.4 million. So we always have a little set aside just in case we run over. Okay. Um, and then in addition to that, we have the 8.3 million in soft costs, which is for the architect, environmental, DOB fees, legal, uh, co-op conversion, the marketing, and also the developer fee. Okay. Uh, in your testimony, you shared 24.5 million. Correct. So that's, there's still numbers, there's still money missing, I think. Contingency? It would be the contingency of $1.4 million. Okay. Uh, what is the developer fee? The developer fee in this project is uh, $1.6 million, which is in line with the ANCP term sheet. We allow for up to 10% of total development costs to be paid to the developer. In terms of the commercial units, mm -hmm. uh, my, my colleague, the Housing and Buildings Chair, Robert Cornegie, is actually the first member to ever negotiate uh, affordable commercial space. Uh, is this a, another Robert Cornegie special? So we will have three spaces after renovation. Um, what we've done on these particular buildings is we've capped the rent at no more than a quarter of the total revenue for that building. So there is room to market these uh, particularly, uh, particular commercial units to uh, smaller bu businesses that are looking for more affordable rents. Are there any additional subsidies? So you have the HPD subsidies. Mm -hmm. uh, are there HDC subsidies? No. Uh, are there, is there LITEC, uh, low-income housing tax credits? No. 
federal, state, uh, other city capital funds? No. Uh, is the, there's no change in the floor area ratios? Uh, Correct. Is, is, uh, is Bridge Street Development Corporation an MWBE, or does it have leadership that is MWBE? Well, Bridge Street Development Corporation, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and so I don't believe we qualify um, you know, okay. to be MWBE, but as far as racial makeup, our board of directors is 95% um, African American, um, about 50% um, women, and 50% men, and our staff is extremely diverse, matching what our board looks like. If, uh, in terms of the, on the job site, uh, will the people who are doing the work and operating the buildings have a, a wage that is commensurate with other people doing similar work in the area? Will they have health insurance if they get hurt on the job? They can go to a doctor without going bankrupt. Will they have disability insurance so that they can't continue, that they will be able to go on with their lives without having to rely just on workers' compensation? Will they be able to retire? Well, I, um, I'll take that as a two-part question. Um, the first part, uh, currently we use a third-party property manager, and because these buildings will be uh, for home ownership, um, there's a slightly different structure, but generally the way we work with our third-party uh, property manager, and obviously this will be the same for Pacific Street, which will remain a rental property, is that all full-time um, superintendents and others are provided with all the benefits that you described, um, and we make sure that they um, have those options available to them. Um, as far as the work with the contractor, we do try to work with the contractor because we do believe in equity. Um, part of the mission of Bridge Street and the work that we do outside of the affordable housing development is to advocate um, both on the affordable housing but also on the community level to make sure that individuals um, and residents who live in the communities that we work with um, are able to find sustainable employment and are able to find employment that can actually help them uh, sustain themselves in the neighborhoods as they change. Uh, again, it is a, a significant challenge. It's something that I know myself and other nonprofits would love to continue to work with you to try to find that delicate balance that helps to uh, allow affordable housing to happen, but at the same time, making sure that we're protecting the interests of the community residents. Great answers, yes. Uh, if you want to give me your card, I will, I will bring you into my uh, group of developers who are, we are trying to push those wages up. In terms of these positions where you're trying to make sure people have health insurance and disability and ability to save and retire and get paid enough to, uh, to, to stay a part of the communities that they live in, do you have a local hire requirement? And my favorite part of these hearings is what number would they call if they'd like a job uh, on these buildings or with uh, Bridge Street Development? projects? Um, as an organization, we don't have a specific local requir hiring requirement, but we do work with all of the various um, contractors and other professionals who help do any one of our particular development projects, and we're particularly concerned because we try our best to identify as many local um, individuals. For example, the architect is a local architect who lives only several blocks from some of uh, the buildings that are being um, renovated, but we do try to encourage and have people give us a call and we try to make sure that we put them in contact with the contractor. Great, so if somebody would be interested in these projects, uh, what number should they call to be in, put in touch with the contractor or architect or any of the other folks on the project? Yes, they can call our general number, which is area code 718 Three nine nine zero one four six, and speak to someone in our real estate division. Great, uh, and I think that takes me through uh, all the questions that I typically ask. I, I would normally ask about accessibility, but these are uh, till uh, buildings. Uh, is there any opportunity to bring any accessibility to these, whether it's uh, adding ramps or? replacing staircases with at grade entrances or what have you? Um, I know we're currently working with our architect who is interfacing with DOB now to make sure that 
um, where appropriate, that if there are additional opportunities for that, that we will be doing that. That is uh, good to know. Uh, is there anyone from the public who wishes to testify? Uh, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on this application and it will be uh, laid over. This concludes today's hearing. I'd like to thank the Council on Land Use staff for preparing today. Whoa, whoa, hold on, sorry, one thing. I didn't get a chance to ask you. Uh, it's, it sounds like your development corporate oh, almost made it out. Uh, like your organization does a lot of uh, work. Is there a question I should be asking all the developers who come before this committee that I didn't ask you that I should have? Um, I think the previous uh, testimony hit it right on the head as far as, um, you know, one additional question. I think, th you know, another additional question is looking at opportunities where nonprofits specifically because of the fact that nonprofits have a vested interest in not only being in the neighborhood for long periods of time, but also reinvesting their profits that they make through the developer fee and other income generated by um, the real estate development back into the, the communities that they serve, that it might be interesting to have an idea of how other developers that are nonprofit, whether they have a similar equation to be able to see um, not just the total value of the development, but the total value of how the income generated by the development is then put back into the communities and serve them. This project uh, will have a developer fee of $1.6 million. How will uh, Bridge Street Development Corporation reinvest that into the community? Uh, generally, um, the way our operating budget works is that we have grants from private foundations and, and other philanthropic organizations, um, including financial institutions, and we do have a significant amount of, of government contracts where we provide services, and then the remaining amount comes from our earned income, which is the unrestricted dollars. And so the developer fee that will be over X number of years will be provided to be able to support the programs that I spoke about earlier, which is home ownership counseling, which helps people who are in foreclosure and help prepare first time home buyers, uh, help support the youth development work that we do around helping them to get employment and be job ready, help provide um, additional services for seniors to make sure that they can age in place and make sure that we're promoting small local businesses on the commercial corridors in the neighborhoods that we work in. Thank you. Uh, I have no further questions. That was a good one, which we will uh, accept and continue. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the, uh, the uh, developers, uh, also a first time. Uh, today I will thank the developers uh, for coming to this hearing and participating and giving honest answers to questions. I'd like to thank uh, HPD for very complete testimony that has allowed us to get through a lot of items very quickly. I'd like to thank the uh, Council and uh, Deputy Council and Land Use staff for today's uh, hearing and members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>